so I remember after that thinking, okay, I should interview Leo and I should connect with Leo and then just kick the can down the road super long time. And I don't even know why it came back up. I think somebody finally said, yeah, one of your, one of your fans. Yeah. I guess a mutual fan. Right. Yeah. When are you finally going to do that thing with (laughs) Leo? And I thought, yeah, it's about that time. You know, let's do it. Yeah. I'm glad we connected. Yeah. Likewise. You've done a lot of kind of crazy stuff actually. And crazy. I mean, this is a busy 30 years if that's what you did in 30 years but this looks like it's a busy six or seven years yeah Actually, well, i don't know which list. list you're looking at oh i'm looking at this oh All that I am is a regular that was guy. within a couple of years actually yeah <laughs> i mean to give people kind of a preview of what we're talking about here since december 2005 and then this this ends i think in 2013 or something like that this yeah. list you quit smoking you became a runner you ran several marathons you began getting up early you got organized for in your house and in your life. You began eating healthy, then vegetarian, now vegan. You tripled your income. You wrote a novel. <laughs> you saved a bunch of money. You got rid of all your debt. You simplified a lot of your life. You, clev- you cleared out your inbox and your desk. That's a whole show, probably. <laughs> uh, you lost 65 pounds. You trained and competed in a couple of short triathlons. You started a blog, made it a top blog, according to Time magazine, uh, wrote a couple of other books, <laughs> did a bunch of physical challenges, and then ran a 50-mile ultra marathon. If you go back to the first thing, it's quit smoking. And then the last thing on this list alone, which is it's out of date complete, by five yeah. years, you know, is you ran a 50-mile ultra marathon. So that is a th- – there's just got to be so many changes in between smoking and running an ultra marathon. Were you like a – hardcore smoker or was it like oh i smoke sometimes or were you like no Uh, it was definitely more than a pack a day wow more than a pack a day yeah i mean i hadn't been smoking since like middle school or anything it wasn't something really long but it was definitely intense yeah (laughs) i mean it says that you're from guam i know you're from guam and i know Mm -hmm. that north the only reason most people know where that is is because north korea says we're gonna (laughs) wipe it off the map or something like that what made us famous yeah yeah yeah. unfortunately what you're famous for is being threatened with nukes (laughs) um but uh, I, th- I think a lot of folks don't really realize – Is tell us about growing up in a place like that. Was that a place where you thought, I'm going to do all these big things with my life, or was it just kind of a small-town feel? Yeah, it's definitely a small-town feel. It's kind of like a smaller version of Hawaii. So it's yeah. like you know U.S. territory, uh, you know Western stuff in the Pacific. But everyone knows each other. No, I mean, not everyone, but of you course, know a lot yeah. of people there. Um, you – Everyone's in each other's business. And yeah. You don't really dream big at all. Like I was a writer for the the local newspaper there, but I never thought I could make it outside of Guam. I always had like these thoughts, like maybe I should go to New York and become a writer. <laughs> yeah. And it was just like that was that's too big. And so I always just thought like be a big fish in a small pond kind of thing. I can imagine that. I, I picture Guam as even further away version of Hawaii that's even yeah. or even smaller Hawaii. Yeah. And when you go to Hawaii and you don't just stay at the fancy hotel, you see a lot of things where you think, oh, wow, this is a family that's probably lived in the same plot of land for a really long time and they're all kind of doing their thing. And you read a lot of, about Hawaiian culture and the small town problems sure. kind of that happen there. So if that's similar to Guam or if Guam has more of that, then I can imagine growing up in a place like that, you think of going to a place like New York to become a writer and it's kind of like – you just grow out of that, just as little girls realize you can't yeah. be a princess or a unicorn riding princess. Yeah. Or like uh, guys think, oh, maybe I'm not going to join the NBA when I because I'm only five foot four. I mean, it's possible, but <laughs> it's probably not going to happen. I'm in seventh grade now. Time to get real. Reality sets in. So if you grew up in a place where you weren't necessarily thinking big, how did that process start with you? You know, because I, I would imagine smoking is one of those habits you just find yourself with after a while. Yeah. But quitting smoking is kind of a big deal. And certainly writing books and creating Zen Habits, the blog, is it's about thinking big at some level. Sure. Well, I mean, it's a great question. For me, it was it was a process of building trust in myself. Mm-hmm. I really had no trust that I could do anything on a grand scale. So I had to do it on a small scale. So quitting smoking actually was a pretty big thing for me. Yeah. And so I had to like take even that into tiny, tiny steps. And one step at a time, after years and years of failing myself and feeling so much doubt about myself and having no confidence in myself, one step at a time, I started to build trust in myself. And you can see this list starting from the quitting smoking. It was a whole process of building that trust. 
And eventually I had enough trust where I can like take a deep <laughs> dive into the unknown. But it, it didn't happen overnight. <laughs> Did you think that quitting smoking was going to be, and I put this in air quotes, I suppose, impossible before you started? I mean, it, it seems like you wouldn't try to do anything without thinking, I can do this. Yeah. So did you always have kind of a can-do attitude, or were you not really, you, did you also develop that somehow? I was hoping it would be possible and hoping that yeah. you know, it was actually going to lead to a chain of events of changing oh, you my were. whole life. Yeah. I had a whole bunch of things I wanted to do. I wanted to lose weight and exercise, eat healthier, like get out of debt, all these really you know, common things, but I kept trying and failing at it. And I just kept like beating myself down after failing. And so I said, well, this this doesn't make any sense. Why can't I do this? And so I I poured myself into the research and figured like, if I could just do this one thing, Mm -hmm. maybe I can make these other things happen. And so, yeah, I definitely thought it was possible. I didn't know how I could do it. I didn't have a lot of confidence in myself. And so I thought if I can it's almost like saving my life by doing this one thing. I, if I could just pour myself into this, I'd save my life. And that's really, really how it felt to me. Cause th- this seems almost even more intimidating to think, okay, I'm going to quit smoking, and then it's going to turn into all these other impossible dominoes being knocked over. You almost added more pressure to the process of quitting <laughs> smoking, right? Like, first got to quit smoking, then I'm going to get into exercise and lose weight, and then dot, dot, dot. Well, I mean, compared to what it was before, it was like, I want to do these 20 things all at once. Right. Like, okay. I want to change my whole life in January, right? Yeah. So, like, I'm going to just take all these projects on, and I kept failing and failing and failing, and I'm like, well, this is not working, so i got to try something else. So I said, let me just pick one, and it turned out I picked one of the harder ones. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe the hardest one on the list, but... Uh, I'm like, I'm just going to pick one and just do everything I can to make that happen. And then I'll worry about the rest later. And that was actually a really hard thing is to let go of all the doing all those other things all right now, because they all seemed really urgent and really important. Yeah. Like quit smoking and pay back debt because I'm not spending money on cigarettes. Right. So I'll pay the debt back and then it all helps. And then (laughs) I'll start running because I'm not smoking anymore. So then I'll start the exercise. It, it seems like it would be really easy to dive into too many things at once and then get discouraged. So did you do habit research and realize, okay, one goal at a time is the way to do this? Or did you just kind of guess your way to success on this one? Yeah, that was a guess. That was <laughs> like, well, this is not working, right? Yeah. So I got to try something different. It was just like, uh, like almost like pulling my hair out, which is, well, I don't have any. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. But I was definitely pulling my hair out and I'm like, I got to do something. Like it was mm. desperation. And so that act of letting everything else, like just pushing it back and saying, I'm going to give myself complete focus. Uh, That was an act of desperation. Like I had to make something work. And so I tried everything with that one thing. I tried everything. I like promised my wife and my daughter that this was going to happen. My wife was a smoker too, but she was pregnant, so she wasn't smoking. But if I didn't quit, she was going to start smoking. So it was about something bigger than me. So I tried doing that. I went on an online forum and And promised all the people on there that I wouldn't, you know, smoke without uh, posting on the forum first. I did a whole bunch of research into quitting smoking and changing habits and mindfulness. That's actually when I started meditating was to, like, replace the the trigger. You know, when I when I got stressed out, I would smoke. And so now I had to do something else. So I learned about habits through quitting smoking. I didn't actually know much about habits at the time, but I, I, I learned and some of it actually worked. And I'm like, okay. This stuff worked. Maybe I can try it for something else. And so I started running. And I couldn't even run for 10 minutes. I was sure. so out of shape. You had some smoker lungs, <laughs> for sure. But then also, I just hadn't been exercising for like a decade. Uh, so I uh, I started putting the same ideas into work for one habit after the other. And after a year, that's when I started Zen Habits, was I had run my first marathon, and I had changed all of these things. But these same ideas were working over and over and over. And so I'm like, I got to share this with people. And so I started Zen Habits and started sharing what worked. Yeah, it's it seems like you've done so many things right after being not necessarily a self-described. Uh, well, if you're smoking, you're overweight, you haven't worked out in a decade. <laughs> there's other stuff that's not going right in the in the in the life, generally speaking. That's right. There's all kinds of things that are a result of that or that you do that because There were symptoms. Other stresses, right? Yeah. So let me ask you this, I I suppose. This is kind of a weird hypothetical, but if you could take back all of the smoking that you ever did, but you wouldn't know anything about habits as a result because you didn't have to quit, 
Yeah, you think I, what, I wouldn't take take it back at all. You wouldn't, because what you know about habits has changed your life so much that. Yeah, if you it's, asked it's me this in 2005, I would have said, yeah, d- yeah, definitely. Right. Get rid of all the problems all at once. But asking me now, um, yeah, I definitely look back and I'm like, this journey was really important to me. It was life changing. I've now helped other people change their lives, thousands of people, and so if I hadn't done all you know, messed up so many ways, yeah. I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing now and know what I know now. A lot of people say that, well, you know, everything, all the difficulty I've been through in my life has left, led up to this particular turning point. But when you hear that, sometimes you're like, well, of course you have to say that. Otherwise, all this <laughs> suffering you went through, you know, is just suffering. You have to justify it. Yeah, you got to <laughs> rationalize it somehow. So I always like to find a time when somebody has actually turned a skill they built as a result of some sort of event or or process and see if that has worked. We, I was speaking with a guy named Isaac Lidsky. He went blind as an adult, and now he understands people and motivations, and he hears things, and he's got this whole different world of experience. And I asked him if he would give up that, that whole experience for having his sight back, and he was like, not even cl- – no way. And that's surprising, right? Because, yeah. okay, smoking, the damage maybe – if, if any, hopefully there's none, you know, you've reco- recovered, but it probably won't show up for decades and decades. But if you go blind, I mean, that's that's your new life starting from that moment onward is without sight. So that it's it's always so interesting to me to find what skills people would trade some other ele- some other irreplaceable element of health, sure. for example, right, of physical health. Uh, I do think that your reply makes complete sense because you, your business is around habits your books are around habits, and at some level, being able to spread this wider than yourself is, you can't quit smoking for other people. I mean, I guess you could for your wife and kids, but the reach of that effect sort of ends there. Sure. However, writing a blog that helps people get out of debt, save money, become mindful, ditch stress, build healthy habits, you've got a snowball effect happening. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's it's interesting because I I started changing, you know, my life and then I started sharing it and people started changing their lives and mm-hmm. I was like like my whole life has changed because they're doing right. the work. Uh, so I started a whole program where I'm helping people change their habits. And so I started working with them and it what what it really did was teach me about layers of habits because you know, the external one is like I'm smoking, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, spending too much, I'm, you know, not exercising. And so I'm like, okay, well, I just need to do these external steps, right? And my life has changed and everything is great. But what I realize is actually underneath that, there's all kinds of underlying like neuroses, you know, (laughs) like why am I not sticking to these habits? And so as I started to do this, I talked about the the trust that I was building in myself. Yeah. I realized I had like absolutely no trust in myself, Uh, but there was also this habit of like criticizing myself and not being compassionate with myself. There was this idea that I had to comfort myself with food, with spending, with all of these other things, TV and distractions, because I was hurt or I was stressed. And so I had to comfort myself. And so I have all of these habitual things, like mental reactions to things that I started to to learn about as I started to unpeel the layers. And I, at first, you know, when I started the blog for the first few years, it, I thought it was all just the external steps. And so I would sure. tell people like quit just, smoking, go outside and get sun. Yeah, kind of I would give them like a list of like ten things to do, like go do these things, and people would be like, okay, great. And they, some of them would actually do it, but but like a big percentage of them would go through the ten steps and be like, you know, I, I can I can't do it. And they like step five, they just stopped. Oh wow. And I'm like, well, why not? I told you all the steps to do. I yeah. did those steps and it worked. And so it, it it puzzled me for actually a few years where people were going through these steps that I was giving them and they would just self-sabotage. Right. And I, I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So I would, I started diving into like, you know, what, why didn't you do it here? So you're diving into other people's problems. Yeah. And my own. Oh, like, okay. I still have, I still have my own problems. Of course, well, of course. Yeah. I just, I just think that for me, especially a lot of the issues I've found in myself and in my past, I've only found, but somebody emails me and I'm like, that sounds so familiar, except for you realized it's a problem, and I just went, well, I'm fine. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And then you're like, yeah, you just kind of ignore mm. it and, like, just look the other way, right? Yeah. I'm like, well, I just ignore that problem in my life. You mean that's been causing you difficulty in your marriage or something? Hmm, that's yeah. weird. Well, these people were, were actually ignoring it. They didn't realize there was a problem. They would justify why sure. they didn't do it, and they give me all these excuses, and I'm like, 
that's not the reason. And right. I had to kind of dig into it. And it took me a while uh, to learn that, you know, part of it was that beating yourself up kind of thing. People yeah. just had this real negative self-image about themselves. And every time they failed, it was confirmation of how awful they were. And they would just yeah. that it would just trigger this whole story in their heads. Again, something that we like we don't see this going on, so we we ignore it. But it's just a story that's spinning around in our heads about how we messed up again and I don't know why what's wrong with me. Right. All of this stuff. And this is going on pretty much all the time for a lot of people, maybe even everybody, that we're we're saying things about ourselves. Some people are like, oh, I'm, I'm awesome, like, yeah. you know, che cheering themselves on. But I'd say that's a smaller percentage. Most people are looking for reasons uh, for confirmation that, you know, why they don't trust themselves. Why do you think that is? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's a good question. Yeah. I think part of it is, is just uh, conditioning. So we have habitual responses to things. And so when we mess up, we might start to hear this voice in our heads that might turn out to be like our mother's voice, or our father's voice, or teachers, or a sibling that would just start beating you up uh, when you were younger, like criticizing you. And the weird thing is, if you look at like a four-year-old, I don't know if you have kids yet. I don't yet. OK, no. well, when you, if you ever decide to, you know, if you have this kid, they're running around at four, five, six years old thinking, I'm freaking awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like everything is great. Yeah. I'm, nothing's wrong with me. You know, I messed something up. So what? Like, yeah. it's per I'm perfect, right? And so they're completely whole and like they think they're amazing. Yeah. And then sometime be nice. between that and like 18, like by, by the time they're 18, they're like, something's wrong with me. Yeah. <laughs> like what happened between six and 18? Puberty, you know? first of all. Puberty. Yeah. <laughs> school. Social status. Yeah, school. Or lack um, thereof. Your parents, your teachers, like always telling you there's something wrong with what you're doing. Right. Yeah. And they're doing it for good reasons. Like they really want you to succeed in life. So they're they're trying to do their best. But right. at some point there's this message <laughs> that there's something wrong with me and, you know, like I need to make myself better, right. which is why the whole self-improvement thing exists, which, you know, you and I are both a part of. Right. Yeah. You know, we profit from that. But. The, the truth is we are trying we're <laughs> <That's true. laughs> there's something wrong with you don't you forget it yeah, yeah. tune in next week where we figure what how, what that might be <laughs> so we we we've, we've had this voice drilled into us from we, when we were like 6 years old mm. and that's a really hard thing to to start to change i think so and i think most of us as adults many of us as adults we find ways to sort of fake our way around that or to there's kind of that layer where you don't realize it. Then you finally think, oh, my gosh, there's all these problems. Imposter syndrome creeps in where you think other people are going to see yeah. all these things that are wrong with me now, too. And then you figure out either how to break through that imposter syndrome by developing self-trust, like you mentioned, or we have that fake cheerleader face that we put on where we're like, all right, I'm just – Glad I got through the day. It's been so great. I have nothing to complain about. And then you just think to yourself, or I think to myself when I see people like that often, like, oh, my gosh, I don't want to see you cry yourself to sleep, <laughs> you know, in the, or in the shower or something sure. like that. Because I just imagine that person with the, the fake happiness is just sort of decided, well, I don't know how to fix any of these problems. So we're just going to get a curtain and just pull it right over that wall with the giant hole in it. Yeah, we def definitely develop a lot of these mechanisms of like not looking at things, not being honest with ourselves. Right. That's I mean, it's really hard because actually if you start to be honest with yourself, it starts to feel pretty crappy. And that's like a yeah. really bad user design. Like you don't want to feel crappy. <laughs> yeah. So you're like, OK, don't look at that. Don't look behind the curtain. You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely a graph of like the benefits and the feeling that you get from being honest with yourself. And it starts with a pretty sharp drop down, yeah. right? Like it's not oh, something you want to do. You're going to be so happy if, once you've been honest with yourself for a year, year and a half, or like in your case with the whole, look, I'm going to die young if I don't lose weight and quit smoking. Yeah. Uncomfortable feeling. Sure, long term, you're at the top right of that graph. But in the beginning, you have to just jump off the fifth floor window, essentially, of this graph. Right. Which is why most people actually, down. yeah, I'm sorry uh, to interrupt. No. But, which is why most people don't actually do it. Sure. Uh, until they hit like some really painful part of their life, you know, losing a friend, losing mm -hmm. a father, you know, uh, you know, hitting rock bottom with alcoholism or drugs or something like that. When you hit that painful place, you're actually really motivated yeah. to like be completely honest with yourself and to start to make some changes. But when you're like in a relative comfort zone, I mean, there's still stress and some discomfort there, but 
you you can pretend and just not look because you're not motivated to jump off of the fifth floor. <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 for sure because you think, well, if I can just sort of fake my way through it in another way, I'll get past this without having to do the dive. Yeah, and doing that deep dive off that graph or into that graph is is it's not something easy to ask of yourself and there's no real foolproof plan. You can have all the support around you in the world, but you at the end of the day are kind of alone at the bottom of that well for a while because even when you're and I noticed this it just myself going through tough times when you hit a hard time in your life or especially if it's self-imposed first of all yeah. but if you hit a hard time in your life especially if it's because you're quitting smoking where most people can't identify with that it's not a death in the family it's not a weird issue that you had with your family member or your kid or financials this is like you deciding to do it most people are happy for you so they think oh cool good you know the only person who understands maybe what you're going through is your your wife and even sure. then that you're we're up at 4 a.m. tossing and turning and you look over and she's sound asleep, right? So you're still kind of doing it on your own. And I think for a lot of people that's terrifying yeah, because it's absolutely. kind of like being alone with the voice in your head and nobody else is there to talk your way through it because you're, you've decided to turn that voice off, that rationalization voice. Yeah. And uh, it's it can be really scary, especially how old were you when you decided to quit smoking and get on track? Uh, like 30, early 30s. Okay, yeah. so that you're young you're young adult at that point yeah you know the younger you do it i think the un- more unlikely it is first of all but also it's a little easier because your life is constantly changing but mm. by early 30 if you're anything like me you kind of had an idea i mean you were already married and had a kid right or I, actually we were on our way to the sixth kid well, holy cow how many <laughs> kids do you have we have six okay. uh what's well, a mixed brady Jeez. bunch family yeah <laughs> just to uh we had two each separately okay uh, from p- different partners and then we came together and had two more okay and we, it was kind of a yeah brady bunch kind yeah, of yeah that is kind of you must have a lot of legos <laughs> on the floor or yeah maybe well the they're past. mostly adults now we have oh, okay. four adults and uh two in the teenage area yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So you, even when you started this process, you were fairly settled as an adult. Well, well. I mean, when are we I'm ever not saying settled? You, I'm not <laughs> saying you were mature or anything. I'm yeah, just yeah. saying you had a lot of life packed in that house. Sure. Absolutely. Um, but a lot of responsibilities. How, how do you break through that rationalization? Because that's one of the most convincing I found. Is look, I can't do this. I have a wife. I have kids. I can't mess with my routine. I've got to keep going to work and performing. I'm not going to sit here and try to run a marathon. Yeah. What's wrong with you? That's something you do in your 20s. Sure. You know, how did you break through that? Well, part of it was actually, you know, the, all this beating up of myself. I felt so horrible about myself. And I also felt like a really bad father. Not only was I in debt and not providing for them the way that I should, but I, also, I felt like I was setting a really bad example. If I didn't quit smoking, my kids were probably going to smoke. That's yeah. a stat that that's shown to be true. Uh, If I didn't exercise and eat healthy, my kids probably were going to do the same. And so I was actually leading them down a path as their father and and leader was like, I'm not I'm not setting a good example for them. And so I really felt I was failing them. And that was just, of course, more reason to beat myself up. Yeah, jeez. But (laughs) at some point I had to just say, you know what, you have to you're you're running from all of this stuff because you're afraid you're you don't like the discomfort of pushing into like quitting smoking. You're you're afraid of failing at all of the, at being a writer and and doing all these other things, and so that's such a self-centered, selfish thing to do is to like just run from your own fears and avoid the pain because you don't like to feel pain, and so I I felt like I had to do something for something bigger than myself, which is why I promised my wife, and my eldest daughter that I was going to quit. It's like this was not just for me. This was actually a step that I had to take for them. Same thing for getting out of debt and all the other things. I was doing it for something bigger than myself, even if it was just, you know, for seven other people than, yeah. than myself. But that was that was big enough for me to actually push into the discomfort of it. And that's really what a lot of this is. It's just saying, hey, I, d- I don't want to face the discomfort of look, being honest with myself, of of, you know, the physical discomfort of any of this stuff. And so I'm going to just keep avoiding and avoiding and avoiding, procrastinating and, and, you know, at work and all that other stuff. And so I had to just say, you know what, I, I had to start to become a grown up, you know, yeah, yeah. like face, face the discomfort, face the truth and start to do the, the hard work. And because it wasn't just myself anymore, like you said, I was a young, not super young adult, but yeah. all my young adulthood 
I had just been avoiding all of the hard stuff. Sure. And that led to, you know, I was like, oh, I'll push that down the road, kick the can down the road. I'll worry about retirement when I'm 60. <laughs> yeah, good plan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I like, just, we all do that when we're in our 20s, or a lot of us do, mm -hmm. is just keep pushing back the problems and pushing it back. But until eventually it builds up into such a big problem that you can't ignore it anymore. And that's what happened with me was some of these problems became so big that I couldn't, I couldn't fake it anymore. I couldn't like ignore them. And so I had to face up to that truth. And I had to say, well, you know what? This running away stuff and this being a little boy of just like not wanting to do any of the hard stuff, this this is stupid. <laughs> like I just need to grow up. Yeah. And I had to do it for them. And so with my love for them in my heart, I had to, you know, like take on this discomfort. Yeah. And that training of of having love in your heart and pushing into that discomfort and the uncertainty of who you 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 know, you thought you were, but you're not really. Uh, the uncertainty of it all, that's something that I've, I'm still practicing today. It's just really been life-changing for me, and I'm. it's now my life's work, actually, is to push into that discomfort with that love and devotion. Easier said than done, of course, because yeah. you still feel fear, I assume. Yeah, but here's the thing. is I, As I'm sure it's, it's the same with you, but for me... The fear has now become a signpost that I'm actually doing something right. Sure. It yeah. used to be a signpost like turn the other way. Right. You know? Go back to Something's the Cheetos in the couch. Yeah. yeah. Or beat yourself up because because of this fear. But mm -hmm. what I've learned is actually, you know, this fear is some area of uncertainty. It's like, you know, like Luke, you know, the Skywalker know, going yeah. into the unknown. Like he he went into this area outside of his farm, you know, like yeah. it was really scary for him. And yet. It was for something bigger and it was important and he had to go into the unknown. And that's kind of like what we are when we push into the unknown is we're exploring some unknown territory. We're learning, we're growing, we're uh, creating and we're doing something for something bigger than ourselves. And so when I see the fear, that means something's right. I'm like shaking. I'm like, OK, I'm doing something right. Yeah, that little adrenaline burst. <laughs> uh, I just had a guy on the show recently named Akshay Nanavati wrote a book called Fear Vana. All right. And it was similar in that he looks at things that he's afraid of and leans into it. Now, he's got a little bit of an extra kick on the end of that because right. he's like, oh, cliff diving. I'm going to go do that now. <laughs> and I'm like, I, I can make a list of things I'm afraid of because they're actually not lethal. <laughs> you know, Go ahead, do your thing. But I, I understand why that can be really inspiring personally and, and builds a lot of trust personally just going into things that you're afraid of. Uh, do you think that you can overdo it with that kind of thing? I mean, is it possible? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what it is is finding a practice zone. So it could just be like sitting in meditation and that could be uncomfortable for you. Mm. Or it could be running an ultra marathon or a marathon and saying this is mm. uncomfortable. It's not like necessarily life threatening, although you know, well, it can be. It depends, yeah. <laughs> but like you're, you know, you're doing something within reason and you're like saying this is my practice zone right now. For some people, it's sitting and writing or doing a podcast like this, sure. some kind of creation, or starting a new business. And so that's like within reason, but it's it makes you shake. And for me, that that's a great place. It's just find even just a small time each day. You don't have to do it all day long, finding some small time each day where you're saying, this is my practice zone. And what you do is you create a ritual around it with a container. A ritual has a beginning and an end, so you know that it's limited. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that you practice every day so that it's continued practice and you hmm. get better and better at it. And you have a space that you can do it and you consider it sacred. And so like whether you believe in God or, you know, some kind of mysticism or not, or you're just a sure. rationalist, um, sacred is just ele elevating the mundane and the everyday into something that's special, right? And so if I said this podcast space is sacred to me, it elevates just an everyday conversation with some recording sure. equipment to something where we are practicing something. Uh, At the sacred folding table. Right yeah, now. practicing our yeah. connection here um, and, and yeah. some of our skills. And that, to me, is worth practicing and worth elevating into a new level. Can you give us an example of what that might look like? Because I think for a lot of people, they're thinking, well... You know, I go for walks every morning. That's kind of the same thing, but it's not sure. really. It's right. It might be, but it's missing some of the elements of ritual that you mentioned. And I think this is important because it's really easy to say, well, I did practice today because I went outside and I made a bunch of phone calls and then I burned 600 calories. So that was my that was my exercise. Or that was my ritual. But it's not quite it's not quite what you're saying. 
Yeah, well, again, and the, the purpose of this is really to practice with that uncertainty and the fear and the, mm -hmm. the doubt and the discomfort, right? Like all that stuff is hard stuff and it's stuff that we would normally avoid. And so by creating this space, you're saying, I really care about this. This is something, again, that's for bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And so by creating the space, you're saying, I'm going to practice in this space and, and it's limited, time limited, right? The other element of that is um, that you create uh, some kind of daily ritual where it's going to be at the same time in the same space, mm -hmm. at least normally. You might be traveling, so you might create a new ritual. But let's say you wanted to write, and that scares the shit out of you, right? So you want to write, and you're like, okay, I'll write, and, but I'll check my email first, and then mm -hmm. I'll go do these things first. And so you still want to write, but you just keep pushing it back and back and back. And if you wanted to create a writing ritual where you actually practice with the discomfort of that, you say, I'm going to write right after uh, doing a few yoga poses in the morning. As soon as I wake up, I'm going to have a glass of water, do a few yoga poses to energize myself, mm -hmm. and then sit in the same space and write every single day for 20 minutes, right? And so you need something to signal the start of that ritual. So I did my yoga poses. I have the, the sacred space, and I might play some music. I might light some candles if I want to. So you can do something to like create a mood or a, yeah. make it fun, whatever you want to do. Um, but you have to start that, that ritual, and you might say, okay, I'm starting the ritual right now, right? And you might actually set an intention at the beginning of the ritual. I, I find that to be really useful. It's like I'm not setting a goal for the outcome, but I'm actually setting an intention for how I'm going to show up in this space. And so my intention might just be, like, I'm going to sit here with my discomfort of mm -hmm. writing and do nothing but write or sit here and do nothing, right? And so, like, I'm I, I like feeling the discomfort of writing, and now I want to run and I want to go check my email. But instead, I'm just going to sit here and just feel that. And one of the things about this ritual is actually I'm allowing myself to feel the discomfort instead of not trying to try not to think about it, trying to avoid it. Right. So by allowing myself to fully feel it, I'm saying, well, this is something that's part of my experience and I'm not rejecting it. I'm actually allowing it in, welcoming it and maybe even finding some gratitude for it because it's actually something amazing. Um, Does that help get rid of those feelings? I know that's not no. the answer that because I'm like, ah, I don't want uncomfortable <laughs> feelings. Exactly. You know, these sound terrible. There's a reason I get up and go <laughs> make tea instead of calling the bank. You yeah. Know? I don't want to deal with this. So I want to avoid it. So <laughs> that's that's actually the problem is that right. no one wants to feel any of this stuff. Discomfort, yeah. stress, fear, like my pain. body and brain has become so good at like figuring out some other thing to do instead yeah. of dealing with that. And so what I've been finding as I practice with this is actually the answer is to feel it, to fully feel it and fully experience it. Um, and what happens if you practice this is actually a meditation where you can sit there like I'm, I don't want to write right now because I'm so afraid of what people are going to think about my mm -hmm. writing and that I'm going to be stupid and I can't do this and all this other stuff going on in my head. I just sit here and don't write. And I sit here and just allow these feelings to come up. And I, I don't even have to verbalize the feelings. I might like respond and say, well, I'm going to fail, fail and, and things are going to be horrible for me and my life right. is going to be a failure. Right? I could do that or I could just feel what it feels like to be scared and shaky um, I and, see. So and you have that self-doubt. So you sort of take the costume off the feeling, right? So you can take the uniform off, I guess. You're feeling something and you think, oh, no, I'm so nervous. What if this happens? Well, if that happens, I'll have to borrow money from my parents. Oh, they're going to think I'm such a loser, an adult borrowing money from his parents. Well, you know, then they're going to oh, they're not going to want to do this. And then that, my wife's parents are probably going to think that, oh, yeah. this is going to be so embarrassing. I'm going to look like this. I'm going to feel like this. And yep. this is what's going to happen in my life. Instead of just saying feeling really nervous have anxiety, my heart's racing. Actually, even deeper something. than that. So what you first described was a whole narrative, right? Yeah, I call it, I call it a story. Perfect. So you, you're telling yourself a story. The story is actually causing some kind of physical feeling in you, right? Yeah, I'm making it worse doing that. I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> I, I know that I do that and make it worse than it used yeah. to be. Yeah, I mean, the fear is caused by the story. Like, oh, the, things are going to go horribly wrong, mm -hmm. right? And now you're feeling something in your body. And so the second thing you described was description of the feeling, right? Mm -hmm. I'm feeling fear. I'm feeling uncertainty. I'm feeling all these different things. That's, right? that's where I get off the meditation train, I guess. <laughs> yeah. The self-awareness train. Yeah, no, that's that's a great 
thing is just to identify you're actually feeling something. So you mm-hmm. recognize you're feeling something. But the deeper part of it is actually, and this is the meditation part, is to f- just drop your your attention straight into the physical aspect of your body. Like, where is it? Is this feeling actually located? And for me, it's often yeah, like in it's the chest. right, yeah, it's right here. Yeah, it's some people it's in the stomach. Monopolized, yeah. yeah. <laughs> some people it's actually in their shoulders and neck. So the feeling could be in different places, but for us, for a lot of us, it's in the same spot mm-hmm. most of the time. So for me, like right here in the chest, and I might actually then turn with curiosity to this physical feeling. And so now I'm looking and like, what does it feel like? Well, I might start to describe it. I'm like, oh, I feel like running away. I feel like, like, now drop that and actually go to the physical feeling. Well, it feels like a tightness Mm -hmm. in my chest. This is a physical description of the feeling. And so I'm actually being curious and investigating this, this actual physical feeling. And one of the interesting things about this is, first of all, you've interrupted your pattern. So our pattern of this is a habitual pattern that we have of spinning the story around or the narrative. Yeah, the story t- takes a left or a right depending on how crappy, <laughs> how much crappier I've been able to make myself feel through the story. Yeah. So if I go straight ahead, I'm like, oh, I feel pretty bad now. And then I make a right and I'm like, oh, that's <laughs> even worse. And then I make a left from there and I'm like, oh, that's, my whole day's ruined now. I got to go take a nap. And but we, I will keep doing that. We yeah. have. So these are habitual ways of reacting to the, the actual physical mm-hmm. feeling which then causes more physical feeling, but it's hab- habitual. We've had it since six years old, basically. Um, so it's habitual, and what we can do is interrupt that, because if we don't interrupt it, we'll just, like you said, stay in it for a long time. We can stay in it for hours, yeah, all day long, actually. So we can interrupt that by dropping our attention from this story to the physical body that we have, right? Um, so that's yeah. the first thing that it does. And the second thing we actually realize is if you actually – investigate this with curiosity, you'll actually find that it's not that bad. It's just like a little bit of tightness in our body and we overreact with the story. It's like, oh my God, there's like yeah. this horrible thing happening. No, it's just like a little tightness in your, your right. chest. Like sometimes it's, it's pretty tight, but it's nothing horrible. Like your chest feels a little constricted. Oh my God, it's panic time. Yeah, right? yeah panic like, attack, heart attack. I must be having a stroke. <laughs> so if you can learn to stay with that for a little while, and that's actually a hard thing to do, but if you can learn to stay with it, you actually realize it's not that horrible and we've been running for nothing and we've been blowing it up for nothing. And you actually learn some trust that actually you can handle this feeling. And after a while, you're like, oh, OK, I, I know this feeling and I'm, I'm actually friends with it. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I've, I've mentioned this before, but you can actually welcome this feeling into you, which is completely a 180 from what most of us do, which sure. is I want to get a, I want this feeling to stop. I want to get away from it. But instead, you're like, I'm actually going to invite it in like a good friend into your house. Um, And that transforms the feeling to like something that you don't want to something that you're like saying, let's let's have tea together. Or at least you've accepted it. Right. It's you're not just resisting it the whole time. Yeah. Or Um, or avoiding it, like not even wanting to think about it. Right. Yeah. I I hate those cliches from self-help. Like what we resist persists. I mean, those are never universally true. They just sound good. Um, But in this case, I think (laughs) it applies quite well. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're trying to run from something, you build up that mystique around that crappy feeling or that narrative. And it's it it ends up haunting you quite literally. We get so trapped in those. And what happens, it also affects our external actions. So I have all these feelings. I procrastinate with the writing. But if I'm also feeling like anxiety or frustration, I might lash out at my wife or my sure. kids or people I work with. Uh, so that's obviously un- that's not, not <laughs> it's yeah. undesirable, right? Right. Uh, it's not helpful. So I'm lashing out or like I'm, I'm feeling road rage or something like that because of <laughs> these stories that I have. Like something about this other person has caused me to like go into this road rage kind of story. And that actually has external things. Like I might drive fast and tense and honk my horn and do all these things, like pull out my gun. No, I wouldn't do that, but... <laughs> yeah, not in California. <laughs> but I might like there, there's external things that, that happen and they can actually have like bad consequences. Were you, did you used to have be a road rage type of person? It's hard to imagine. I had, I, I've yelled. Uh, I've never pulled out a gun, but <laughs> I've like rolled my window down and like flipped people off and like <laughs> oh, yelled man. pretty loudly. So that's... Not on your list of Zen habits. <laughs> <laughs> Not my proudest moments, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. I'm not sure what the story was there, but it wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, probably a, a mix of other things going on in your life at that point, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one article that I saw that I really thought was interesting that this is a habit so many of us have, the destructive habit of evaluating everything that we do. I'd oh, love yeah. to talk about this because okay. 
when I as soon as I read this, I thought, oh yeah, that's that's me, hundred percent. Did a workout, great. Didn't do a workout, well, maybe did did I walk? Did I do this other thing? Well, yeah, okay, kinda. I'd give myself a pass, but I I know really that I'm giving myself a pass, so I feel bad there. Should I eat this? No, but I'm really hungry and I want it. Then you eat it. Damn it, you know, you could have resisted that. You need to remember next time how shitty you feel. And yeah. it's just one thing after another. There's almost no time where I feel like I'm not doing that. I'm sure those times exist. I think right now <laughs> is probably one of them. But even after this, I'll go, oh, you know, I should have done that. And I should have paid more attention to this. Oh, I'm bouncing around in this chair and you can hear it. Damn it. You know, yeah. that will happen. And this is not a good habit. And it had never occurred to me that there was another choice. I thought everyone does this and that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah, actually, everyone does do it. And I don't think you can actually necessarily stop it from happening. Mm -hmm. It's just like a natural thing. It's like, this is good, this is bad, this is good, this is bad. And we do it not only with our, our own actions, but as we go around you know, the world in our office, in our home, I'm like, I don't like the way that she's acting right now. Oh, I like the way she's doing that. I like it when she does that. Oh, I don't like that. I do like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly just like judging the world you know? right. <laughs> and yeah. myself yeah. constantly. Um, and, you know, there's there's some ways where you can be like, well, I like this. And so I want to be encourage more of that. Right. Right. But what that leads to is actually more like it's in, in Buddhism, it's called greed. So it's like constantly wanting all the things that we like. Right. Like mm. and that can that's actually what led to me smoking too much. And it le led to me uh, eating too much. It led to my debt. It led I mean, it leads to like numerous problems. Right. And and then and that's also why we go to distraction, social media and all these sure. these great things, wonderful things. But we just constantly we like looking at these pictures. I mean, we literally like them, but we we're yeah, like yeah. judging them like, oh, I like this and I want more of this. And that feels better than doing the hard work that we, we've been running from. And that's the thing that we evaluate that we don't like. So, like, I don't want to feel the uncertainty and discomfort of writing or or doing some other kind of creation. And so I'm. Avoiding that because I've judged that as bad and I'm going towards the thing that I really want and I'm judging that as good. And so it's just this constant like going towards the things we want, running from the things we don't want. And again, I actually think I look think of this as my like little boy self. It's like <laughs> all I want is the candy. You know? yeah. I want the marshmallows and like I don't want any of the pain and, and difficulty. And I remember as like a, a, a little uh, at, when I was in school, right, I would. Um, constantly push off the homework like I can do that later I can do that later and that's when my procrastination oh uh, yeah <laughs> habit that'll started do it. that'll do yeah, it yeah it's like I don't I don't want to do that now I don't want to do that now I'll do it w later when when the time comes and then I would actually like stress out but th I never learned my lesson right <laughs> so I was like r avoiding the things I didn't like that was too hard sure and going towards the things the video games and all the other fun things that I really wanted to do and you can see that this actually has horrible consequences uh, like in our habits, yeah. but it also has bad consequences in our relationships and as we think about ourselves. So it seems quite human then to constantly evaluate ourselves and others. It seems quite natural. And people want to be worthy of praise. We want to make sure that we're doing things that elevate us. We're constant. Well, if you're anything like me, you're also doing this comparing your habits with other people sometimes or comparing yourself with other people. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's as universal. Absolutely. And the problem is we compare our blooper reel to other people's highlight reel. So we look at Absolutely. all of our mistakes and we look at what they've crafted for us on Instagram <laughs> and it's an unfair fight. But how do we start to get out of this? Because compare, comparing yourselves to others is, is tough. That's going to be something that's going to be a constant life struggle. But how do we stop even that first little step of evaluating each of our little actions? Because it happens so often and so fast. It's not just a, it's not, almost not just a habit. It's almost like a reflex. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's absolutely a reflex. It's at that kind of reflex level. Right. And so you can't always, I don't think you can stop it most of the time. What you can do is say, Oh, I'm doing it again. And it's like if you've been like, you know, hitting yourself or like <laughs> scratching an itch. Okay. Right. So you're scratching an itch and it starts to bleed. Like that's not good, right? Right. That's so like, okay, it's no I gotta, longer an itch. I gotta stop scratching these itches because it's, you know, obviously causing me problems. And so sometimes when you have an itch, you can just habitually start scratching it. You can recognize that you're scratching it and you recognize this is gonna lead to bleeding, right? That's this is what, mm -hmm. what's happening. Is just like, oh, I'm scratching again. And so you can do different things to like stop yourself from scratching. 
but I think the, the main point of it is actually just staying with the itch. So, um, and, and just recognizing that the itch is not that bad. And that's the discomfort and uncertainty that I was talking about. You can actually just stay with the feeling and not necessarily say, I need to get away from this. I, I think this is bad, right? So this feeling that's inside me is just a, it's just a sensation. It's just a tightness in my chest. And so if I can just stay with that, it's not good or bad, it's just an experience. And a lot of times you can you could actually reframe it if you want and say like the sensation means that I'm learning, that I'm growing, that sure. like I'm you know, something is great. And there's nothing wrong with reframing things. But what you can do is actually just learn to stay uh, with whatever that itch is, whatever that that feeling is, and not need to like say this is good or this is bad. This is just my experience right now. As I sit here with you, mm -hmm. I can be like, well, you know, I'm screwing up this interview. Or like, <laughs> I'm I'm kick I'm kicking butt here. Come right? on, Leo. Yeah. Get it together. I can do that, or I can just have the experience of being here face to face with you, which can be a beautiful thing. Um, but it's just an experience. And in fact, what we can learn to do is actually love all of these experiences and find the beauty in every single moment, whether it's like the thing that we normally would judge as bad or not. It seems like a such a nice idea to just love every feeling that you get yeah. or give every feeling that you get some kind of love. Um, I imagine that trying to do that, trying to feel that way or trying to let feelings happen that way, I guess you would say, in a in that sort of meditation practice is kind of the equivalent of when you're on like an airplane and you get an itch in your back and you just you can't reach it, you realize <laughs> there's no way you're gonna get that itch. Or you're in a yeah. snowsuit, right? Where I grew up. Um, probably don't have those in Guam. No. But, but imagine you're all bundled up and this is a very Michigan thing. You're walking outside and you go, crap, my lower back itch is a lot. Oh, yeah. You're not getting in there. You're not gonna scratch that itch. You can lean up against a mailbox, you know, but it's not gonna happen till you get home. You gotta walk home, yeah. take all that crap off, and then you can get that itch. So you get almost philosophical about it, where you're <laughs> like, I'm gonna focus on the itch, and then maybe it'll go away. And then sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Or you just keep walking and you go, eventually this itch, I'm gonna wait out this itch. <laughs> it will give up before you're me. You're like more stubborn than the right, itch is. Yeah, right? you're more stubborn than the itch. And it seems like it just gets harder and harder and harder. And then, of course, you get home. By the time you get all the stuff off, you've pr pretty much forgotten about the itch. <laughs> and, of course, if you're like me, you're like, I'm going to scratch it anyway, just in case it's still there. And I just didn't know. And then, of course, you, you a phantom itch there. Yeah, or you find a freaking huge spider in there. And like, Damn it, I knew I should have gotten this thing off because um, it's been in the basement or your garage it. for four months uh, or eight months before the, the next snow. But these these types of feeling itches, these uncomfortable these uncomfortable sensations, we don't have the choice to scratch them most of the time unless that scratch is actually distraction. I guess distraction no, We is scratch the scratch, our itches right? all the time. And sometimes it's just us spinning around a story in our heads. Sure, okay. So, okay, like, that I, makes sense. Like I, didn't, like, I didn't like something that you did, maybe, and so now I'm just going to, like, maybe I'm not going to lash out at you. I'm going to bite my tongue. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to stew inside and just, like, constantly spin around a story about how sure. horrible Jordan is and what an inconsiderate jerk he is. You know, yeah. just like constantly do that. And that's scratching the itch. That's scratching the itch. Okay, yeah. gotcha. And actually, so here's the thing is you, you won't always scratch yourself, stop from scratching the itch. Like you might sit in meditation and you're like, okay, I can't, I, am, I got the snowsuit on, right? I can't right. scratch. But actually you can, in meditation, you're just sitting there and you can like spin around stories in meditation the whole time. And like never have like paid attention to your breath at all, right? Sure. I feel or like that's edge. how I used to do it. I was <laughs> like, this this is hard, man. How do people sit here and beat themselves up for 45 minutes? Yeah. And then you start spinning a story around about how stupid this meditation is. And like, sure. this is useless. I don't know why I'm doing this. And I should be like doing my work mm -hmm. and all these other things. And like, I just want to get up right now. And I don't know why I'm putting myself through this. So we can have habitual stories about that as well, which is scratching the itch. And so here's the thing is you can't actually stop yourself from doing that all the time. You're not always going to stop the scratching. And so what you have to do is when you notice yourself spinning the story around about meditation or about the other person or about yourself is just like smile at it because there is like this, this you know, I, I, there's a recognition that this is just a human thing that we do. It's not necessarily a bad thing where we need to slap ourselves for scratching the itch sure. it's more like oh there i go again like that's just a tendency that i have and that's you can be friendly towards your own failings 
And I think that's actually one of the most important habits that we can develop is learning to be friendly when we mess up and when we scratch the itch. Because beating ourselves up, even though it feels like it's worked for us in the past, maybe isn't the best course of action to continue forward. Is that beating it? ourselves up is actually more scratching the itch. It's like, oh, I've been scratching the itch. Damn it, you're so stupid. You know, like, <laughs> Stop scratching the you're, itch. You're yeah. actually scratching the yeah. itch then. It's like judging yourself as really bad and then starting to like just constantly rail on yourself. Yikes. Yeah, it, it can be really tough to not get lost in those spirals with meditation that it, it is very hard mindfulness in general meditation aside just mindfulness in general the chief problem that i seem to have with it on any given day is as soon as i sit down i'm like okay i have re just remembered something and i need to write it down right now <laughs> and that happens so often right and i used to give into that because i thought well okay well i'm not scratching an itch i just but i do need to write this down this the important. problem is you could do that for 40 minutes straight and never <laughs> meditate. There's a lot of stuff going on There's upstairs. a lot of things you just need to do just for a minute. Right. Um, and so that's actually a really good learning. That's one of the things I love about meditation is as you start to like try and get away from the meditation in different ways, you're actually seeing your habitual patterns <laughs> in action. Yeah. It becomes very clear. It is clear. Like, oh, I need to like go do this one thing real quick. It's a, it's a rationalization that you have and actually most of us have is like, oh, if I just do this one thing real quick, it won't, it'll be okay because this is important, right? And I can put this thing off, this thing that's uncomfortable and go and do this thing that will just take a second, right? Right. And so you're actually, well, we are all actually doing that all day long. It's like, oh, I'll, I'll do this, but in a second because I have to do this real quick. Yeah. And it's a justification that we have in a habitual way of escaping. And so in meditation, if you're if you're doing um, you know, a good job of setting that ritual in that container, it's like you're saying, I'm not actually going to allow myself to escape. And then you'll see some even more deeper uh, habitual reactions come up of what happens when you don't allow yourself to escape. It's really like some dark stuff sometimes. I'm sure <laughs> that it is. Whenever friends of mine are like, oh, I'm doing a three-day meditation retreat, I just think, oh, my God, that sounds terrible. <laughs> and when they do it for 10 days or something, I'm just yeah. thinking, I would die. Yeah. I would... You're evaluating yeah. it, though. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah. I, I'm just thinking even about sitting on the floor for more than 10 minutes would hurt so much I'd want to die. So here's what, one interesting thing is that this is your ego, yeah. like saying, like asserting itself and saying, no, I'm, I'm not putting myself through that. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm more important than that. And so it's it's like saying it's defending itself, basically. And what happens when you pour yourself into a ritual like the three day or one day meditation uh, retreat is you're saying, I'm just going to let go of my ego right now and just fully melt into this practice. And that's a hard thing to do. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm already, my ego is already rejecting the idea. You come up with reasons why, rejecting it. why yeah. you shouldn't do it. Right? Maybe I'll do it this summer after I settle a few things, you know, yeah. maybe I'll do it later. <laughs> so in that case, what happens, you need, what you need to do is like treat the ego as like this little child that needs mm -hmm. to be led along. And you're not you're not gonna just like throw the child off the cliff diving cliff, right? Right. No, <laughs> like, probably not. Have fun. It's terrible right? parenting. <laughs> no, <laughs> like they'll never want to cliff dive again, right? So you take treat the ego the same way. It's like okay, let's just try a little bit, right? And so you that's how I did it with with all of my habits. It's like okay, you know, it's really hard to do this, but let's just try five minutes of meditation or two minutes of meditation. So you just kind of like lead it in, lead it in, and it's like exposure therapy for for people who have fears. Is like you give yourself just a little bit of that, a little dose of that that fear, and you can deal with it. And you're like, oh, okay, that wasn't so bad. And if you just keep giving yourself those doses, actually, you can increase the dosage over time, and eventually, like the fear is gone. So this is you know exposure therapy, and you can do the same thing for your ego. Oh, man. Exposure therapy for the ego is like just allow it to, you know, pour yourself into something just for a few minutes, and just completely just let go with that, and not need to like justify and get out of it. I think a lot of people who work on this, when I, I meditated all through high school because I was so stressed out. And then in college, I kind of thought, I don't really need to do this anymore because college, to be honest, was not that hard. Yeah. Right. I've worked a lot, but it wasn't it wasn't that stressful except for around exams. And so you kind of think you can get rid of this. But what I've noticed getting back into it a little bit, at least as an adult, is it's, just, it's an onion with a million layers. Yeah. And you keep every time you think, oh, you know, oh, I'm getting through this this stuff that I just mentioned with having to write things down, oh, this is so great. Now I can finally get rid of that and I won't have to worry about that anymore. And there's just one thing after another. And I'm wondering, are those habits all there 
already or is our mind actually coming up with new ways to just reject this practice of sitting down and being yeah. <laughs> Are, they're there all the time you know i mean a, a different triggers that, that will bring it up but they're there all the time and they're just like i said our habitual reactions it's our our minds like defensive mechanisms and we develop them when we we're young as a way to deal with discomfort and stress so like you know someone criticized us uh, or they told us we had to like go and you know sit in a classroom all day long right like we had to do something that we didn't like and so we developed these like mental patterns to defend ourselves and it's like if you're a little kid and you're getting beaten down by your parent right like there's nothing you can do you physically can't beat that parent up or def no. defend yourself so you Not have to yet do anyway. you have to do something yeah. habitually to stop yourself from that pain from feeling that pain and so what you might do then is shut down Right. So you're completely shutting yourself down and saying, I don't need this. I don't I don't need to feel this. I don't need that person. They're not important to me. I, I'm self-sufficient and I don't need to feel anything. And so this defensive mechanism worked for you when you were a, a kid and being beaten down. But now that you're, like, say, married and your wife like criticizes you and you shut down with right. the same defensive mechanism, it's not so it's not serving you so well because she feels that. And then she shuts down because you're like shut down and you're emotionally unavailable and now she feels abandoned. And so like she has her habitual reactions to feeling abandoned. Right. And so we have these habitual things that we developed as defensive mechanisms as kids and we still use them as adults all the time and they don't serve us anymore, but they did when we were kids. I see entrepreneurs doing this a lot. I know you probably work a lot with entrepreneurs as well. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you notice how this stuff crops up in business? I see this all the time where someone will shut down with their business partners or will decide I'm, you know, you're bullying me. And the other person's like, what are you talking about? And then you think, Hmm, this person's really sensitive to perceptions of bullying. And then they resist Absolutely. and then they self-sabotage the project. And so I think a lot of people who think I don't really need this kind of thing. I'm fine. My marriage is strong. Yeah. Or I'm raised. My kids don't hate me. They don't necessarily. We don't necessarily know if this is infecting more our, our marriage, our personal relationships, friendships, or in business. I think a lot of us don't look for the business ramifications of this, but yeah. they do creep in and they show up. Absolutely. And sometimes they are amplified because it's business. So there's relationships, but there's also money. And it's just like all kinds of stuff. You're just up. pouring a lot of chemicals into that <laughs> toilet, right? Into that mix. Yeah. Yeah. So here's an amazing thing about entrepreneurs and creative types as well, is that we have put ourselves into a, a space of tremendous uncertainty. Mm -hmm. We've found the courage to do that. Most people don't do that, and and entrepreneurs do. Um, you're you're actually taking greater risks than most people do, and putting yourself out there and creating something amazing in the world, and that's amazing, and yet that the stress and uncertainty and self-doubt that comes up because of that will trigger all of our habitual reactions. All of it comes up. And so when we, if, especially if you're working on a team with, with someone else, maybe your wife yeah. <laughs> is on the team, like right. there's, there, the, you're now in a situation of like great stress and uncertainty and you find ways to deal with that. And so some of it is habitualizing things, systematizing. So I'm like, I found the perfect system. I'm gonna drink my bulletproof coffee and right. do my incredible morning rituals. And this is a way that entrepreneurs and creative types use to deal with that uncertainty, find some stable ground under their feet, because you're now in this like floating around, uh, jump, jumping off the cliff, mm -hmm. nothing under your feet. So you have to like erect a structure, right? Yeah. And that is useful. And yet it doesn't actually allay all of the doubts and uncertainty. And so what happens is because I've now systematized my whole life and I have everything down and I have my virtual assistant taking care of all my emails and everything, right? Like, I should be great, and yet I still feel all this this crap, right? Yeah. And so what happens is now I blame other people for it. That's my one of my habitual reactions. First one was getting control and systematizing. Second one maybe is saying, well, it's it's Jordan's fault because he's not doing all these things on time and he's doing things wrong. And Right. I've got my systems. <laughs> I'm doing my part. He's yeah. not doing his. His systems are broken. So you're blaming other people or you're, you're finding ways to avoid. And so these are some of our, our systems of blaming. We might lash out at people and start blowing up. And you'll see this in, in lots of entrepreneurs as they start blowing up for like like small things. But for them, this is actually just the the tip of the iceberg, the small thing is like they're they're The iceberg is all the uncertainty they've thrown themselves in, into. And so that one little thing just tips them off because their habitual reactions already like 
I, I'm, I, I have a whole bunch of reactions going off. And now this one little thing just set off that last one and it just made me blow up. So we have these things going on. And you'll, you'll definitely, when you put yourself into uncertainty, you're going to see your habitual reactions come up. And you will justify those reactions. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to give my a... reactions are right <laughs> and yours are wrong. Yours are an illusion. So if anyone's interested in seeing their habitual reaction, I'm going to give you guys a challenge. People listening to this and, and Jordan, you too. Okay. Um, so five minutes of meditation every day for the next 30 days, starting, to, starting tomorrow. Okay. Uh, five minutes as soon as you wake up. So you wake up, maybe you, you go to the bathroom, uh, drink a glass of water, and then no, nothing between that huh. and, and meditating. No, no writing down any notes, no checking your phone, no nothing. So try and accept that challenge. And if you don't accept the challenge, see what's going on in your mind when you're trying to justify not accepting sure. the challenge. Sure, like five minutes is a long time. I have things I have to urgently do, yeah. but they can't wait five minutes. Yeah, Yeah. so if, if I issued this challenge, and so people listening to this have already, let's say 90% of them have discounted it. They've already said, oh, that, that's dumb. I don't... You know, sure. Leo, who's Leo to tell me what to do? I'm not going to do the challenge, <laughs> but other people listening should totally do this challenge. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm, I'm totally enlightened. Yeah. Right? So see what your mind's doing when I issued the challenge and see how you've already justified not doing it. Yeah, I actually was just like, he's going to tell the audience what they should do. Yeah, I don't need to. I'm going to stand over here and not listen. <laughs> I'm already awesome. <laughs> yeah. right? So uh, Damn it. And that's fine. Uh, you don't actually have to accept the challenge. My point is, by issuing the challenge, I've now tried to put you into a box. And you have now shown your habitual reactions to being put in a box. And so some of you have said, okay, I can do this. Like, mm -hmm. that's does not a big challenge. And What I can do you have to prove out there? People yeah. who accepted it so readily. Come I think on. that's amazing that you've now <laughs> accepted my invitation. And now what I would like you to see is when you wake up tomorrow morning, what does your mind do when you know you're supposed to meditate so first of all make sure you put some kind of visual reminder when like something next to your bed yeah when you wake up you should see this reminder it could be a note it could be like a meditation cushion it could be a big teddy bear whatever it is right. something that you'll see and you can't you'll have no excuse to not meditate and then see what your excuses are and when you sit down see what your mind does when you start to meditate and maybe it's not till day 15 that you see your habitual reactions but i think some point along the way either like by pushing off and saying, I'm not going to do it, or maybe on the first day, or maybe sometime along the way, you'll see your mind's habitual reactions. What's your ex escape? Because when you yeah. cut off the external escapes, your mind will try and create its own escapes. And that's really fascinating to me is when you start to see that. Yeah, because if you don't just forget because you have the visual aid, which is if you forget, you forget, right? Then you're, you're like, oh, well. I didn't do that consciously, so you let yourself off the hook. So you have to take that out of the equation, put the reminder down. Yeah. And that's when you go, yeah, but I oh, I do should I should be up for the kids because yeah. I just want to make sure the kids are fed and then I'll go meditate. Or actually, you know, I would, but right now I hear the landscapers outside, so I'm going to wait until they're done and then I'm going to go meditate. Well, you know, I'm going to brush my teeth first and then I'm going to make coffee and then I'm going to go meditate. I don't know who says I have to do it right after I wake up. I'm going to do all this other stuff first. And then you just realize, oh, wait, crap, these are all escape mechanisms that my brain is latching yeah. onto. Distractions or throwing tasks in your own way. So those are the, the patterns that I get are, and especially in years past, was busy work. I would have 300 unread emails, many of which were important, but I'm like, well, but my LinkedIn profile needs updating. <laughs> so that somehow magically has equal priority on the list with going through Absolutely. that or, or my accountant's like, hey, can we get on the phone today? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I got a lot of Facebook messages. So we'll have to play that one by ear. And he's like, what's in your Facebook inbox that has to do with your taxes? This deadline is like in a month. OK, fine. <laughs> I'm going to handle that first. But it's really easy to start justifying. It's ridiculous when I say it out loud. But in the moment, it really looks like you do have to get that email inbox down to zero or you really do need to. Absolutely. Do it feels true. This other thing before you handle this really uncomfortable thing, because even though you know one thing is uncomfortable, the other thing's also important. So all the all other things being equal, why not just do the one that sucks less, right? So and I'd like to offer problem. two other things. So one is if you decide not to meditate, if you if you decide to meditate and then you decide not to, and you start to see your uh, habitual, you decide I'm going to push this off and I'm going to go check email. Mm -hmm. Email me. 
My personal email is L, just the, the letter L, at zenhabits.net. And you won't get any spam. I, you won't get Zen an habits. autoresponder. Net. Yeah. I'll get the email personally. I won't reply, but I won't also send you anything. So there's no, like, marketing here. I want to know what your habitual reaction is. Like, tell, tell me what your mind's justification was. I would love to hear this. What kind so of stuff what, do you get in that inbox? Just like... Well, this is the first time I've offered this. Oh, really? This. Yeah. Oh, cool. I've never yeah. offered this before. So this is just to your listeners. You've but, got mail for sure, though. <laughs> so if you put it off and don't actually meditate, tell me why. Tell me that your justification. I would love to hear what your mind habitually does. The second thing is, if you do meditate, you're, what you're doing there is you're cutting off your escapes for five minutes. You're saying, I'm not going to allow myself to habitually escape. That is an amazing thing to do. You're taking some courage there and saying, I'm going to see what happens. And maybe the first day, like, you know, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. um, and you can listen to a guided meditation, but I would suggest just staying with the breath. What happens is your mind will start to do some stuff within the meditation space, right? So what I would like you to offer you there is a practice with that, is notice what your mind's doing. Like, what story are you telling yourself? And then notice why your mind's doing it. There's, a, again, a, some kind of tightness in your chest, maybe some kind of pain, maybe some kind of stress, feeling of anxiety, mm -hmm. whatever it is. Like, oh, I need to go do something real quick because this is really important, right? So there's a feeling there. Yeah, that's so familiar. Yeah. yeah. So there's, it's a feeling that comes up in you. And maybe it's a little bit feeling of panic, maybe just like, oh, I, I need to do this. Um, but there's some kind of physical feeling. So what I would ask you to do is notice what you're saying and then notice what you're feeling. And go to the feeling and stay with that. Just like shine the spotlight of your attention onto that feeling and just investigate. Just be curious. Just welcome it and just stay with it as long as you can. And that's, to me, like really transformative if you can just stay with that feeling. Just focus on that itch. Do that for 30 suit. days. Yeah. Wow. That's and a, then email me when you're done with that. I would love to know if you did the 30 days. A lot of people, a lot of, this audience has a lot of folks that are going to do it. All or right. a lot of folks that are already been meditating for years. Of course. Like, come on, Jordan. Well, how come you don't talk about meditation as much? <laughs> so if you've been meditating yeah. for, for 30 years and you meditate for, for half an hour, then I would, uh, I would challenge you to double your meditation for 30 days. There you go. Wow. 30 years, 30 minutes a day. Those people. They're crazy. Like, they're crazy. They're like, I don't need to take advice <laughs> from the cliff you, divers. whippersnapper. <laughs> yeah. I've been meditating for 30 years. Let's wrap with being decisive. This is a, a common high performer roadblock being mm -hmm. indecisive, which is kind of counterintuitive. You would think people who get a lot of stuff done and a lot of people who are really good at their career, they've got advanced education. Those are decisive people. I've actually kind of seen the opposite. Sure. I know a lot of high performers, even executive level folks that really struggle with being decisive because among other reasons, they don't want to be wrong about yeah. something that's really important. They've built a reputation or a right. self-image. Yeah. And, and that's a very common fear. So, of course, instead of making a decision, they'll do things or we will do things like research something to death. Absolutely. And I mean to death. To the, at the <laughs> cause, like, should I, I'm still deciding whether to go to this festival this weekend. It's Thursday and it's in Texas. What are you talking about? You're still deciding. Yeah. Well, I'll, maybe I'll get tickets online. And I'm just thinking... Now is the point at which it's so stressful to go to this festival that you shouldn't go, yeah. you know, but you're, oh, I'm still deciding. And I hear that a lot. And I do similar things in my own brain with certain specific topics. Absolutely. And then procrastination kicks in because there's so many factors to weigh now. That there's probably other areas where, where you're very decisive, though, I'm guessing. For me, I'm, I'm actually quite decisive personally now, having worked on it for okay. a long time. But- it didn't before that. I just thought I need to weigh all of the data, yeah. everything. Yeah, yeah. But it, only in things that I was afraid to do. It was never. Absolutely. It was never like, should I go out with my friends? Well, the pros and cons. Are, no. It's, <laughs> what What's going to happen if I take this particular risk? Right. You know, what happens if I ask Katie out in the middle of math class next week? Here's yeah. seven thousand paths of <laughs> that, chains of events that could happen as a result. None of them, by the way, were what actually would have happened after that. They're all just mental exercises to waste time. But a lot of folks, even now as adults, have a lot of issues with being decisive at work. Which job do I want? Which person do I want to date? What kind of freaking dog do I want to buy? I mean, there's all kinds of indecision. If you could guide us through some of the practice that you've had to become more decisive... 
that would be super helpful. Yeah, and honestly, this is still a practice that I'm practicing now, so I'm not perfect at it, as with any of this stuff. But what, So one of the things that you mentioned that's going on is when it's an area, in certain areas, when it's an area full of uncertainty, you're undecisive, and you have mm-hmm. habitual reactions to that too, not to sure. beat a dead horse or anything. But that's ex- exactly what's going on is you want to research something because what you really want is some certainty. So you'll Google it, you'll, you'll like look at all the research, You'll look for the answers that other experts will give, and you'll read a book on it. You know, like th- you're looking for someone to hand you the answer, or give you some kind of certainty or permission. Yeah, like yeah. of course I got that one. It's the best one. I spent 17 hours looking online, and the general <laughs> consensus is LG TVs are the best. Right, and so right. that gives you a, a sense of some c- certainty that this is the right choice. Right. right? Uh, so you're you're filled with uncertainty, and you habitually react by looking for certainty. And the truth is you actually can't get certainty. You might get like a percentage certainty, like mm-hmm. this is 80% chance this is going to do pretty well, and all these other ones are like little 1% chances, and I don't really need to worry about those, right? So you can like do some kind of like statistical probability like analysis, yeah. right? And that's totally legitimate, but you still won't have any certainty. Um, so what I'm suggesting is this is your habitual reaction. Notice that you're doing it. Uh, even touch into the uncertainty that you're feeling in your body. But then just realize, like, I at some point I need to just pull the trigger and, you know, see what happens. And just look at it as like a science experiment. That's kind of how I look at it. It's like I'm just going to, you know, just test this and see what the results are. And it could be, like, horrendous, but probably I'm not, I'm not cliff diving, right? right. I'm not going to die. <laughs> so, like, if you can do these experiments and just constantly do small experiments and just see what the outcome is, eventually what you do is to develop this trust that things are going to be fine. Like you're not going to like fall apart um, and that, you know, you can trust in the process. I think that might be easier when you can minimize the consequences. So sure. if it's, well, what if I choose the wrong job? Well, then you get experience in a different type of job, different company culture. You can always reapply to the other place. You'll right. have two, a year or two more experience. You're not losing the time. But I think it might be different if, well, what happens if I make the wrong choice? Well, then I've got to lay off 3,500 people. Absolutely. And I'm going to be forced out of the company by the board <laughs> and et cetera. So I think if we can minimize the consequences, we could say, this is just like a nice experiment, experiment with my career. But if yeah. you're at the top of the totem pole, it's like, this is an experiment with a lot of other people's careers, too. Yeah. And maybe this gets harder. Absolutely. I mean, and I'm not going to downplay the difficulty of those sure. kinds of decisions. And actually, I think in those cases, it's actually completely justified to do a little research. Yeah, yeah. A little. <laughs> just a little. Just a maybe, little bit. You know, like the slide deck. Yeah. <laughs> do some evaluation here. I mean, at that point, when like people's <laughs> jobs are in the line or lives yeah. are in the line, Absolutely do a little bit of research and, you know, like <laughs> weigh out the, the yeah. consequences and, and try and find the best path. But I think most of the time that's not what's going on. I no. Think most of the time we're, right. not, we're not at that level. Um, and and so, even if we are, I think, do you think we can build up the trust uh, in ourselves by building these up little bricks at a time? Because I, I notice with people who are yes. indecisive, it's often the same people. Uh, sure, sometimes we're all indecisive in certain areas, but I, I know some folks that can't even decide what they're going to order at a restaurant and they don't know what kind of relationship they want, and they don't know what kind of career they want. They're yeah. indecisive across the board. Yeah. And so I, I remember talking to a guy like that, and he was like, I don't, I don't know what career to choose, right? And he had a bunch of other things like that, like you just described. And I said, well, how are you going to find out? And he's like, I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, well, is there a way to know for sure which path you should choose before you sit down on any of them? And he's like, no. Well, then the only way to know is actually start to walk down mm-hmm. one of the paths and say, well, I've walked down this and I can tell definitely this is the path or it's not the path. So that's the only way to find out is actually to start to, to take action and do it. Um, and so that to me, you're actually the, the risk of not acting is much greater than the, the risk of acting. Most of the time is, is the, the risk sure. of acting and finding out you're actually going to get a little bit more certainty by by taking some making a decision and taking some kind of action. So yeah, absolutely yes. start small and and start to do those, you know, the easy stuff first. Uh, don't deal with a laying off 35,000 people decisions yet and start to get good at the decision making process early on. But also see that sometimes you have to just make a decision and test it out and find out along the way by testing. 
Sure. Realizing that the consequences are, I think the key for me was minimizing the idea that the consequences were real, especially if we're talking about pancakes versus, (laughs) you know, a bagel. And then also taking a look at the end, because I think one key turning point for me with indecision was looking back on it because in the middle of the moment you have to figure out oh my gosh I'm just going to make the decision and then you do it and you go good I made the right decision but that's not really what necessarily happened yeah what happened and you only find this out if you look at the end of the process is you go I made a decision and everything was fine yeah was the other decision potentially better we'll never know it also doesn't (laughs) matter right so then you have to remember that feeling and that outcome the next time you face indecision indecision itself you have to think okay last time i just made a decision no evidence that it was 100 percent correct still ended up with a positive result that's happened 68 times out of 100 this is a good path for me to take. Absolutely, and, uh, and on a less less like scientific note, uh, one thing that really works for me too is to come from a place of curiosity rather mm-hmm. than fear. So fear is stopping us from making a decision. Sure. But what if we had a, a place of curiosity where we're saying, "Well, I don't know the answer," and that's perfectly okay to not know the answer. But I would actually like to find out more about this. I'll, I'll never know the perfect answer, like sure. you were saying. But I would actually like to find out what this path is like. And so you go down that path and you're like, well, I don't know what that other path is like, but now I've learned a little bit more. And it's actually amazing to explore something new rather than like, oh, I don't want to go down the wrong path and I'm not going to walk any path. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, So so curiosity. And then for another one is just to like make it fun and play in the middle of that path. It's like, okay, well, I don't know what it's like to launch this new product that I'm, I'm launching. Let's find out. Let's find like, out. Yeah. Let's have fun with it and and play and and mess it up and uh, allow ourselves to just like make a huge mess of everything. And sure. that can be a lot of fun. And you know, like like you said, if the consequences are horrible of this product failing, maybe that that'll bring a little fear into the game. But yeah. But at the same time, I think if you're if you're staying in that place of fear all the time, that's not really. To me, that's not a healthy place to be. So I'd rather come from a place of curiosity, fun, playing, and exploring. Exactly. I mean, look, the guy who invented Crystal Pepsi is probably still there. <laughs> so if that if he can survive that, we can survive anything. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, what would it be like if there was no color and we could yeah. see through our Pepsi? I love it. I love the idea. Let's do it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Go I it. actually don't know if that guy's still there. That was a pretty bad idea. Even hey man, he made history. You gotta. You did make history. That. Yeah, as one of like the worst product <laughs> ideas. Although, really, you only see that looking back, right? I mean, why do we need caramel flavor uh, coloring? We really Who knows? Don't. It's just it's Coca-Cola we were too... had it, and that's why. There's actually not much of a taste difference that I, was, I don't remember. No, actually. I don't even know if there's a taste difference at all. Yeah, it's just you... like what we're used to. Yeah. So he was messing with people's habitual reactions, and I love it. Yeah. Now he's probably a self-help writer <laughs> because I don't know if he's designing beverages anymore. We'll see. Thank you, Leo. This has been great. Super fun yeah. interview. I had a lot of fun. All right. Cool. We good? <laughs>